Hi guys, if you've been following my privacy journey, you already know I used to love and use the Tor browser. But my recent videos have exposed how and why I can no longer trust the Tor network. Well, if Tor can no longer be trusted, this leaves a huge gap. And sadly, I have not found any one-for-one -one replacement yet. Now, there are a few options, but many of them still rely on the Tor network. Tails and Wonix, for instance, are great options, but both still use the Tor network to hide your real IP address and keep your online activity anonymous. So I want to explore the Invisible Internet Project, or I2P for short. It's meant to be something different, something independent, something that doesn't ride on Tor's network, but aims to deliver strong anonymity in a whole other way. In this video, I'll break down what I2P is, how it works, and whether it might actually be the real deal for staying anonymous online. I'm not here to sell you hype, so you should stick around till the end because I'll also be talking about its limitations. Let's get to it. So what exactly is the Invisible Internet Project I2P? At its core, I2P is an anonymous overlay network. This means it does not replace the internet, it runs on top of it, creating an encrypted, self-contained environment where users can communicate without revealing their IP addresses or physical locations. But I guess here is where it becomes fundamentally different from Tor. Tor routes your traffic through a handful of relays, typically three an entry node, the middle relay, and an exit node. The last one, the exit node, is where your traffic hits the open internet. That's a known weakness, because once your traffic leaves the exit node, it's no longer encrypted and can be sniffed, logged, or manipulated. I2P doesn't have an exit node. This is because I2P wasn't built for accessing the normal internet. It was built for anonymous services within the I2P network. These are what are called IP sites. So you're thinking of .i2p domains. This is similar to the .onion domains you have if you're on the Tor network. So instead of hiding your traffic as it goes to Google or Reddit, I2P creates a dark net of its own, where both the sender and the receiver remain anonymous inside that system. When you use I2P, your traffic is not sent through a single linear path like Tor. Instead, it uses a concept called unidirectional tunnels. The best way to explain this is that every I2P connection is made up of two tunnels. One for sending data, this is called the outbound tunnel. And then the other for receiving data, this is the inbound tunnel. And these are one way, which means even if one gets compromised, the other remains independent. Each tunnel is a sequence of volunteer run routers, and they change frequently, typically every 10 minutes. This reduces the risk of long-term correlation attacks. But it gets more interesting because I2P is distributed in a way where you, the client, choose and maintain your own tunnels through the network. This means there is no centralized directory service like Tor's consensus system. Routing information is handled through a system called the NetDB, which uses a technique called distributed hash tables. It's kind of like a decentralized phone book for anonymous peers. And all traffic in I2P is end-to-end -end encrypted, layered multiple times using garlic routing. If you've heard of onion routing from Tor, garlic routing is a similar idea but maybe more advanced. Instead of routing a single message in layers, garlic routing bundles multiple messages together, each with its own encryption, making traffic analysis significantly harder. So to summarize, no exit nodes equals less exposure to de-anonymization, unidirectional tunnels equals better compartmentalization, Client-managed routes equals no single point of failure, and garlic routing equals stronger resistance to metadata leaks. But don't mistake I2P for a miracle solution. It's optimized for anonymous services and messaging inside the I2P network, but not for general web browsing. 
That's a key distinction, and I'll get more into this later when we talk about limitations. Now let's install and configure I2P. It's a bit more involved than launching tour, but I'll guide you through each step. First, we head over to the official website, and as you can see, it is available for numerous operating systems. But if you're using it on Windows, Mac, or some other OSs, it may be counterproductive because you already know these systems do not care about your data privacy to any great extent. So I'll be using the Ubuntu 24 Linux distro. Now, this bit is important. While I2P is available in many Linux distribution repositories, I'll be downloading it directly from the official website. This ensures we are using the most up-to-date version, as official sources often provide newer builds and important updates faster than some distro-managed packages. So once in the download website, I'll leave a link in, this, this, in the description. Under the I2P for Linux section, you'll see a file called something like I2P install 2.8.jar. These figures may change depending on when you watch this video. Download it. Now you need to run the installer, but first make sure Java is installed. I will launch the terminal and run these two commands. sudo apt update, and then once it's run, I will also run sudo apt install default hyphen jre. Now I can run the installer with the command java space hyphen jre space i2p install underscore 2.8.2. You will get a graphical setup wizard, choose a location, your home directory should be fine, and then follow the prompts. You can safely accept the defaults unless you want a custom install path. Now this process installs I2P in user space, meaning no system-wide changes and easier to sandbox or delete later if needed. After installation, navigate into the I2P folder. You could use the CD command to do this. Once you're in that folder, start I2P by running I2P router space start. This launches the I2P router in the background. Then open your browser and go to 127.0.0.1 colon 7657. You're now inside the I2P router console your personal control panel for everything I2P. What you need now is to set up your browser. I continue with the bandwidth check. It's running the test and has allocated 80% of the bandwidth to I2P. By default, I2P traffic doesn't route through your regular browser, so we'll configure it to tunnel.i2p sites through the I2P proxy. In any browser that supports Monal proxy settings, change HTTP proxy to 127.0.0.1 and then use port 4444. Change HTTPS proxy to 127.0.0.1. Here use port 4445. You could leave socks blank unless you want to configure it manually for specific apps. Make sure to disable DNS over HTTPS if you're using Firefox as it can bypass the proxy settings. Once these changes are made, you will no longer be able to visit normal sites. So I recommend you do this on a separate browser profile. Now you will want to verify your connection is good. Simply type 127.0.0.1 um, colon 7657 slash config in the address bar and hit enter. The network value should be OK or firewalled. Anything other than this is not great. Now here is a downside. You will have to be patient as it takes some time to build up. So if you're just connecting, you may expect that some links will not work right away. Now let's talk about what you can actually do inside the I2P network. The first is browse IPSites. These are anonymous websites. Inside I2P, websites are called IPSites and they use the .i2p domain names. But unlike normal websites, they are hosted and accessed entirely within the i2p network. You can visit them from the regular internet. They are not indexed by Google, Bing, or any other popular search engines. And they don't resolve using DNS. They resolve using i2p's internal cryptographic address book. 
So here are a few examples. Stats.i2p, this shows network status and peers. Identityguide.i2p is a decentralized pseudonymous social feed. I2PD.I2P houses a bunch of resources. So for instance, I can visit the Tor network from here. For some other services, you may need a jump service as they may not work right away until your address book is updated. And even with that, some jumps will still fail. Legwork.I2P is I2P's own search engine for IP sites. There is another way to use jump services. If you are in the stats.i2p page, you may click address book services. Now select host lookup and jump forms. Now you can impute the service link and click jump. I have copied a service link and now I paste it here and click jump. Jump failed in this case, but other times it may be successful. If you're more technical or want to contribute, you can host your own websites right inside the i2p network. You don't need to register a domain or rent hosting. Your site lives inside I2P, identified by a cryptographic destination key, and hosting can be done locally, and you can share your .i2p address or jump URL with others. This gives you true control over your content and identity without depending on third-party platforms. The second thing you might do is send anonymous emails with I2P boots. I2P comes with its own email-like system. It does not rely on SMTP or POP3. It's fully encrypted and serverless, so there is no central point of failure or login. And you send and receive messages using I2P identities, not traditional email addresses. So if I return back to the home page, that's 127.0.0.1 colon 7657. Under applications, I may select email. And now I can log in or create an account. If you're really serious about anonymous communication without third-party email providers involved, then this is a big deal. You might access it via your router console. Just look for I2P boot under services. The third thing it does is using anonymous file sharing. It's called I2P Snack. This file sharing mechanism is a torrent and it's a privacy enhanced fork of BitTorrent. As expected, it works over I2P tunnels only. With it, you can download and seed torrents without exposing your IP address. And you don't need to trust outside trackers. Everything stays inside the network. This is a great option if you want to distribute files securely without relying on the public internet. You will find it in your console too. Just click on torrent and you're in. All right, now let's talk about the other side of I2P. Because while it sounds powerful on paper, and it is, there are some serious limitations or trade-offs you need to understand before you put your trust in it. First, it's slow really, really slow sometimes. Pages take time to resolve, file sharing crawls, and messaging isn't instant. If you're coming from the ClearNet or even Tor, expect delays, especially when your router is still building tunnels and populating its peer database. Number two is that you are locked in. Unlike Tor, which allows you to browse the public internet via exit nodes, I2P is mostly internal. You can't just Google things, that I2P sites don't work outside the network, and you won't be able to access the usual .onion services from Tor. This is by design, however, I2P is meant to be self-contained, like its own private version of the internet. But that also means it can feel isolated and empty, especially for new users. Limitation number three is that it's harder to discover content. So there is no central index or search engine that just works great. You often need to use jump services or paste base32 or base64 addresses manually. Some IP sites go offline and disappear completely. And discovering new communities or tools isn't always straightforward. It's almost like the early days of the web where it was almost impossible to find what you really need. Limitation number four, it's still a niche experimental network. I2P has been around for years, but let's be honest, it's still a niche project with a relatively small user base, especially when compared with Tor. You have fewer developers, 
fewer services, and fewer real-world audits. This means the ecosystem is less mature, and bugs or performance issues can go unresolved for a while. And the fifth limitation is that it has a steep learning curve. Unlike the Tor browser, it's not plug and play. You have to configure your browser manually, jump through hoops to access sites, and understand concepts like list sets and tunnels to really know what's going on. There's no big name foundation behind it, no huge documentation push, and definitely no billion dollar company making it user friendly. If you're not comfortable being hands-on, you will hate it. So what's the bottom line? I2P is not perfect, and it's not for everyone. And it's one of the only real alternatives to Tor that doesn't rely on the Tor infrastructure. And that alone makes it worth paying attention to. But still, Tor is simply more robust. If you're someone who wants full control, total decentralization, and is okay with a little extra effort, I2P might be the next frontier for you. Well, that's it for this video. You could make up your minds with the piece of information I've given to you. And let me know in the comments what you think about I2P. Will you be using it? Are you dishing tall just like I am? I look forward to hearing from you. And till the next video, stay safe out there.